now listening to the place for unfiltered, no holds barred truth from the Word of God, the Remnant Report. I am your host, the Remnant Warrior. Here you will learn what's really going on in this world we live in, as well as what we can do about it. Make no mistake, friends, we are right in the middle of a war for no less than your very souls. The enemy has spies everywhere and will certainly use every weapon that he has because he knows that his time is short. From the very beginning, God declared his end. From all Calvary's tree, we find forgiveness of our sin. So he who hath an ear, let him hear. Open your eyes so now you can see. The king is coming in the clouds with ten thousand of his holy ones. To save the righteous, judge the wicked, lay the prophet and the beast. So now, let's get this program started. Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another edition of The Remnant Report. I am your host, The Remnant Warrior, and I guess it's tonight, I almost said today, but I'm running just a little late, so it's actually 6.25 p.m. here on the East Coast, and uh Tonight we are going to be talking about a subject that many, many in the prophetic movement, all of the prophecy pundits, many, many have tried to identify the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. Um, Guys, let me know if you can hear me okay. Um, I uh, haven't really seen any comments, so I uh, <laughs> I don't know if you if you can hear me or not. Um, I should be on Facebook Live and on YouTube, but. I truly need to look and make sure that uh, you guys can hear me okay because uh, for some reason the comments are not coming up on my screen and it actually is possible that um, they are blocking me because the last episode of the Remnant Report that I did was actually blocked so I am going to uh, look and all right I can hear me on YouTube just fine so that means everything's cool um, hey Jim nice to see you glad you're here uh, like I was saying though the prophecy pundits have tried <laughs> again and again to identify these two witnesses. You've got many who say that they are Moses and Elijah. You've got others who will tell us that they are uh, Moses and Enoch or Elijah and Enoch. And, you know, they give their different reasons for why... Um, they believe that these particular people are the two witnesses. But today, I am going to... I'm not going to guess on this because, to be honest, when I tried to use uh, human wisdom and my own insight, you know, I, I kind of came up with each one of those names as well. Um, you know, I went back and forth on Moses, Elijah, Enoch, Elijah, Enoch, Moses... 
But I did a program here on the Remnant Report uh, a few months back. It was a Revealing Prophecy episode, and it was on the power, the Holy Spirit power in the Tribulation Church compared to the power of the Holy Spirit in the Church of Acts, the Apostolic Church. And I kind of hinted on what I am going to show you tonight, but truth be told, when I said who I believed, it was at the end of the program, and who I said I believed the two witnesses were, I was truly and honestly guessing. You know, um, I had a very good reason for uh, believing that's who the two witnesses were. However, it was not, uh, it, it didn't come from the Holy Spirit. It came from the brain of Jeremy. It was definitely not something that the Lord showed me. But when I saw this, I was studying the book of Revelation. And I was actually, it was Mary Callie and myself. Um, I, when I saw it, I was reading um, Revelation chapter 11, and it just jumped out at me. And I was like, oh man, I mean, it was just one of those, one of those paradigm shifting moments, you know. And once you see the truth, I mean, you can't unsee it. You can pretend like oh, well, that's not it, or I didn't see it, if you do not want to believe it. But once you see the truth, you can't unsee it. And if you try to deny it, you're, you're lying to yourself. And I told Mary, and, you know, Mary is one of the most skeptical people that I have ever met. And at first, you know, she didn't believe, she said exactly what, I have said many times, and what many others have said, which is, no, you're wrong. It's two, it's Elijah and Moses, or I can't remember the two people she said, but it was two people, two prophets come back um, in the tribulation to uh, receive the power of God and, you know, prophesy. Uh, just like Revelation 11 says that they will do. And it, I, like I said, Mary is one of the most skeptical people that I have ever met in my life. And she, like I hope all of you, would not believe it until I showed it to her. I had to literally go in the text, and we studied it out together, and I uh, showed her exactly what I was talking about, what the Holy Spirit had shown me, and she was just as amazed as I was, because it was right there in the text, and once we both saw it, like I said, once you see the truth, there is absolutely no unseeing it. I'm sorry, guys. I am uh, sharing this program really quick because uh, I forgot to do that at the beginning. So I'm going to uh, share this really quick. Let's see, share. won't take me but just a second and we will go into the word of God and I will show you what all the fuss is about Mary uh she you know she's on sabbatical right now she is uh she's not doing any social media she's not doing any of her programs and um She's taking this time to uh, go into the Word of God and just spend time with the Lord in the Bible and in prayer, and I truly commend her for that. That is something that we all need to do more of, and, um, you know, I have taken sabbaticals from 
you know, social media, social media and people the same way to, um, I did it when I wrote my book and I've done it to, uh, you know, to do the same thing for the same reason she did to, uh, you know, get closer with the Lord. Um, I am going to have to do something real quick. I hope that it does not affect the program, you know, in a bad way, but it is really, really getting hot in here because I uh, cut the air conditioner off so it would not um, affect the sound, but I am uh, I'm going to have to cut it back on. That's just all there is to it. So, if you will give me just a second, I'm almost finished sharing this. I will share it more after the program is over. I've shared it enough. All right, give me just a second. I am going to cut this air on and then we are going to dive into the Word. Okay, once again, I apologize, and now we are going to dive into the Word of God. All right, we're going to start off. I want to show you guys something, um, and this goes back to the last program I did that was a Prophecy Revealed program, the one I was talking about on... Uh, comparing the two churches, the church in Acts, the apostolic church, and the end times remnant, the tribulation church. And uh, starting in Revelation, let's see, Revelation chapter 1. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to look at... We're going to start with verse 9. Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 9. And it says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now this is very important. Verse 13 says, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were like white wool, as white as snow, and his, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass. And if they burned as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, 
and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Okay, now I want to say something really quick. This is Jesus Christ who John saw. Now, before John saw Jesus, John saw seven golden candlesticks. And then he saw Jesus in the midst of the candlesticks. There are seven golden candlesticks. And in verse... Verse number 19, it says, and this is chapter 1 still, it says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. Listen. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So we see in the very beginning of Revelation, Jesus tells John that the churches are represented by the candlesticks. The seven candlesticks that he saw were the seven churches. How many churches were there in Revelation? Seven. Now, these were actual churches. Dispensational theology and eschatology would have us believe that these churches are representative of different church ages. And I guess, uh, you know, to a, a degree, they are right in the fact that each one of these churches, each one of the seven churches, uh, can be found all throughout history not in a specific church age, in each of the so-called church ages, you can find uh, churches that fit the description of each one of these seven. However, we are going to look at the actual seven churches and what they represent for the end times church. Because like I said, each one of these individual bodies of believers can be found in each, uh, each part of history, including this part of history, the very end of history. Now, unto the church of Ephesus, Jesus tells him to write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou cannot bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and, and for my name's sake has labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Now, this should be a wake-up call to each of the groups of believers who have fallen for the eternal security, once saved, always saved, lie. Because if you could not lose your salvation, if there was no way to lose your place, your name in the book of life, then... Jesus would not have told five of these seven churches 
that he was going to do just that. Take away their salvation. Remove their candlestick. Guess what? If your candlestick gets removed, you are no longer a church. In order to be a church, you have to be a candlestick. In other words, you have to do the commandments, follow the commandments of Jesus Christ. And we see this later on. There are, I'm going to, you know, for time's sake, I want each one of you to uh, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. And you'll see, if you read chapter 2 and chapter 3, you will see for yourself that out of these seven churches, these seven candlesticks, Jesus tells five of them to repent or else. He, and not just or else, or else he will remove their name from the book of life, or else he will remove their candlestick. So say what you want, believe what you want. If you want to follow the traditions of men rather than the word of God, do it at your own peril. Because Jesus Christ said, repent, lest I remove your candlestick and your name from the book of life. We see, I want to look now, at because I told you there are five churches that Jesus tells to repent. That means there are two churches that he doesn't have anything bad to say about. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something when we get to the church of Philadelphia, but we're going to start with the church of Smyrna. And the church of Smyrna is in chapter 2. Uh, it starts in verse 8, and it says, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. And I don't think I have to tell you guys who the synagogue of Satan is. I'm pretty sure... That if you are watching the Remnant Report, you know exactly who the synagogue of Satan is. But for those of you who just happen to turn to, you know, turn this video on and have never watched me before, then allow me to give you a hint. Which religion has or, or worships in synagogues? There's only one. There is only one religion. One group of people, and when I say one group of people, I mean one group of religious people, you know, worshipers, those who are worshiping a deity, who do it in a synagogue. So, you know, do with that what you will. But Jesus goes on and he says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Now, he tells them they are going to suffer. Now, remember, I told you this is an actual church, but not only is it an actual church, but prof prophetically speaking, it represents a specific church that is going to be here during the tribulation. You can say, because this is the truth, that not the actual people who were going to these actual churches or who were a part of these um, church bodies, but the churches themselves, because each one of these churches are a type and a shadow. One thing you have to understand with prophecy is in all of Bible prophecy, both Old Testament and New Testament, you always have a type and a shadow. Um, and one perfect example is of this is, I think it's very easy for us to look at all 
of these seven churches and realize that although these are actual bodies of believers with real people that attend the churches, they also represent actual bodies of believers and churches all over the world today. There are many, many churches who have left their first love, who were at one time on fire for God, and they, they cannot bear things which are evil, and, you know, they, they uh, have patience, and have labored for Jesus' namesake and have not fainted, but nevertheless, they have left their first love. And you also find churches like uh, the church of Thyatira, who Jesus says, I know thy works and charity and service. So they have works, they do good works, they uh, do charity, they do service, and they have faith and patience. And the last, I'm trying to figure out how to say this, it says, and the last to be more than the first. In other words, um, they have continued doing these things. But also it says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce the servants and commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, how, I mean, we know that there are churches like that today. There are actual bodies of believers who allow prophetess, prophets and prophetesses to uh, give false prophecies. Just think about the, the 2020 elections and all the prophets who prophesied the victory of, uh, you know, he who should not be named. <laughs> and... They were wrong. They were false prophets. There were also women, prophetesses, prophetesses, however you say it. So there are also churches like Thyatira. There are also churches like Sardis. It says that Sardis, um, they have a name that they are alive and are not dead. And Jesus tells them to be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. So he's telling them that they're not doing everything they're supposed to do. It says, Remember therefore how that thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. That goes right back to when Jesus talks about coming like a thief in the night, and later on in Revelation, when it talks about him coming like a thief in the night. Well, it's when he says he's coming like a thief in the night, it's not talking about the rapture. And it's not talking about the church. The ones who he is going to come on like a thief in the night are the non-believers. It's the non-believers who he's talking about when he gives the parable up and says, you know, if the master of the house knew what hour the thief was going to come, then he would have been ready for him. Well, he didn't know because he represents a non-believer and the thief came on him in the night. Now, the church of Smyrna, the one we read about just a minute ago that Jesus had nothing bad to say about, 
this is representative of a church body both in the early church because the, the whole reason that this program truly ties in to the program we did on the Holy Spirit power of the two churches, the one in the first century and the one in the last century, the tribulation church. The reason that this truly goes right along with that is because the church in Smyrna represents a actual church that was in the first century when John wrote this around 90 something AD. I think it's like 93 AD. And also the body of true believers in the tribulation. But wait, the body of, there's, there's more than one church here in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 that Jesus has nothing bad to say about. The other church is the church of Philadelphia. Now, the church of Philadelphia is in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. And it says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast kept a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, this is the verse in Revelation chapter 3, and this is the church in Revelation chapter 3 that the dispensationalist pre-tribbers used to say, see, this represents, Philadelphia represents the rapture of the church, but it truly does not. It, Jesus does not tell them that he will keep them from tribulation. He does not tell them that he is going to rapture them. As a matter of fact, there is absolutely not, not one single verse in the entire Bible, Old and New Testament, that says anything about a pre-trib rapture. It's not there. And I'm not the only one who says that. The actual pre-trib uh, rock stars like Hal Lindsey and uh, Tim LaHaye and uh, even the sacred cows like um, Dr. Um, trying to remember his first name, Pentecost. I think it's uh, Dwight Pentecost. Don't quote me on that, but he's uh, was uh, I want to say he was the head of, if he was not the head of, he was definitely a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, and he uh, was also a, a mentor of Hal Lindsey's. And all of them admit, freely admit, that there is no verse in the Bible that talks about a pre-trib rapture. And the verses that they do give 
can easily be debunked. I am in the process of reading a book right now that I recommend all of you read, especially if you have fallen prey to the false doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. And the name of the book is called Reclaiming the Rapture. And it's by Doug Hamp and uh, some other guy. I can't. It's, it, two men wrote the book. I, I can't remember right now who the, the co-author's name is. But in any case, uh, Douglas Hamp, who I'm sure that uh, many of you know, um, authored the book. And I don't agree with everything Doug Hamp says by any means. Um, you know, he is kind of big in the Hebrew roots crowd, kind of, but not really. He's on Skywatch TV sometimes. You know, he's got people from Skywatch TV who um, write the forewords to his books and stuff like that, which really surprises me because all of the people at Skywatch TV are dispensational pre-trivers. I mean, they all are. But this book, Reclaiming the Rapture, really breaks down the rapture itself because although the word, the English word rapture is nowhere in the Bible, um, the word that we use for rapture is, uh, I want to say it's harpazo, and it literally means the uh, the catching away and it, it represents the rapture and there's many many verses going all the way back to Genesis I, and I had no idea about this there are verses that go all the way back to Genesis and that are there are many of them in the Old Testament and New Testament. The New Testament verses that talk about the second coming and the rapture of the believers, um, you know, most of us know what they are. But I had no idea about the Old Testament verses talking about the rapture. And the reason I didn't know is because dispensationalist pre-tribbers have gone to great lengths to make people believe that there are no Old Testament witnesses of the rapture, that the first time that the rapture is mentioned is in the New Testament, but that's not true. And I found that out from reading this book. I'm not finished with it, but uh, so far it's a great read and it's spot on. But back to the subject at hand, the two witnesses is what we're talking about. Now we have read through the churches we have found out that there are seven churches in the book of Revelation. Each of these seven churches represent a group, an actual body of believers who were alive and, uh, you know, a part of the ecclesia, the body, during the time that the book of Revelation was written. These are actual first century churches. But more than that, they represent actual churches that are around and alive today. Each one of these churches, you can find a church, and you can find many churches for that matter, that fit the description of each one of these churches. Now, you can't find many churches that represent the church of Smyrna and Philadelphia. And there is a very good reason for that. The church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia, two of them, two candlesticks. Remember, the churches are the candlesticks. Jesus walks among the candlesticks. Okay, These two candlesticks, one of them, the first one, the church of Smyrna, Jesus tells flat out, that they are going to have to go through tribulation. He tells them that, Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation 
10 days, but be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, Jesus doesn't say you are going to die. That's not what he says. He says, be faithful unto death. In other words, do not denounce my name. Do not, you know, keep the faith, follow the commandments, be faithful to me, to the church, all the way unto death. If you, if you have to lose your life, lose it. And if you are faithful, that faithful, you know, willing to die for the cause of Jesus Christ, then I will give you a crown of life. He tells the church in Philadelphia that he tells them that because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the whole world. Well, he does not tell them that he's going to keep them from going through the tribulation. He doesn't tell them he's going to rapture them. He says he's going to keep them from the hour of temptation. Now, both during the first century, because during the first century church really the first and second century church, the church was going through tribulation like has never been seen before or since up until the tribulation. When the great tribulation comes, it's not like dispensationalists teach. It, the great tribulation is not the day of the Lord. And it's not the wrath of God upon the earth. The great tribulation is the wrath of Satan, the dragon, and the Antichrist against the church. It is Satan's wrath against the sons of God. Now, when I say the sons of God, I do not mean the sons of God from Genesis 6 and the Old Testament. I mean the New Testament definition of the sons of God. You know, all of those who accept Jesus Christ, to us, we have been given the right to be called sons of God. So, it's the sons of God in that context that I'm talking about. Now, the other five churches, you've got two churches that Jesus has nothing bad to say about. The church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia. The other five churches, Jesus tells them, I mean, this is really simple to understand. He tells them to either become like Smyrna and Philadelphia so in other words, join Smyrna and Philadelphia, not necessarily join the body of Smyrna and Philadelphia. You know, they don't have to necessarily change their membership because, you know, we're all a part of the body of Christ. But he's telling them that if they do not become the type of followers as Smyrna and Philadelphia has, then he is going to take away their candlestick, wipe their name from the book of life, and therefore we see here in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we see seven churches turn into two churches. Two churches. Now we know that we are all one body of believers, right? But, and we are all the bride of Christ. However, in Revelation, Jesus himself points out the individual bodies of believers 
as separate entities that are a part of the same entity. Kind of like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three different beings, but are all three one God. I hope I have made that clear to where you can understand it. Now, keep these two churches in your mind. Keep the fact that they are represented and called the candlesticks. Keep that in your mind. And we are going to turn to Revelation. We're actually going to start in Revelation chapter 10. Even though what we're talking about and dealing with is in Revelation chapter 11, I want to start in chapter 10 because... In Revelation chapter 10, we see that there are there are these um, starting in, it actually starts in, uh, let's see what chapter it starts with. Well, in any case, we see that there are seven angels with seven trumpets, okay? And uh, this starts in chapter 8. It's actually starting in verse 2 where it says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And we're not going to go through all of the angels and all of the trumpets. We are going to go forward to Revelation chapter 10. And we are going to see that starting in verse 7, it says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. So we see he doesn't completely blow the trumpet, but he is about to blow it. He is just about to begin to sound the trumpet, the seventh trumpet. And it says that when he begins to sound, he hasn't even sounded yet, but when he begins to sound, like when he's right there ready to blow that seventh trumpet, what's the seventh trumpet? The seventh trumpet is the last trumpet. Now, I feel like I need to point something out to everyone. The book of Revelation is not a book that goes in chronological order. You don't start with Revelation chapter 1 and, you know, that's the beginning and you read through till Revelation 22, which is the end. That's not the way Revelation is written. Revelation actually repeats itself. And if you try to interpret Revelation without understanding that it repeats itself, you are going to get lost. If you try to read it without understanding that it repeats, you are going to be very lost. Now, um, we all know that the four horsemen, you know, they, they start riding and, um, let's see, uh, well, in, first in Revelation 4, we see that uh, John looks and there's a door open in heaven and he hears the voice as a trumpet that tells him to come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Okay, now this is another place where pre-tribbers say this is the rapture and this is what they, this is their uh, logic. They say Revelation chapters 1 through 3 a spe because chapter 1 talks about, at the very end, it says that the seven 
lampstands are the seven churches. And then chapters 2 and 3 actually describe the churches. And then in chapter 4, you see John being taken up to heaven. So the pre-tribbers say that after Revelation chapter 3, the church is no longer mentioned in the book of Revelation because when John is taken up into heaven, this is when the rapture takes place. But <laughs> that is called reading your particular man-made beliefs into the text because that is not what it says and it's not even close to something that it hints at. But anyways, we see John taken up to heaven in Revelation chapter 4 and you know, he he sees the the throne room of God and he sees the throne and it's described with the rainbow all about it and uh it describes the the 20 four elders and the 24 seats with the 24 elders sitting all around the throne. They're clothed in white and they have on their heads these gold crowns and it says out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices and um, you know it pretty much describes the throne room of heaven at the beginning of chapter 4 and then it talks about uh the um, four beasts that are round about the throne who had the eyes, you know, all around them, in front of them and behind them. And it describes the beast, which are really, they're, they're angels. If you look at the description of these beasts, they're uh, really describing something like a seraphim. Um, and they cry, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, uh, day and night. And um, in chapter 5, it starts off, you know, saying that him that sat on the throne had a book in his right hand, and on the back side it was sealed with seven seals, and then a strong angel proclaims with a loud voice, you know, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals. And of course, there was no man in heaven or on earth or under the earth who could open the seals. And then, of course, it says, finally, and I'm paraphrasing and skipping through for time's sake, you know, finally, it says, uh, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and in the midst of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So Jesus comes and he takes the book with the seals from the Father. And the, um, the four beasts and the 24 elders, they fall down before the Lamb. They fall down before Jesus Christ. And they all have hearts and vials full of uh, the prayers of the saints and they sang a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof for thou was slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. So we actually see that the elders the elders have to be believers. They have to be human beings because it says here that Jesus, that his blood, and because he was slain, he redeemed them to God by his blood of every people and kindred and tongue and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So we see that these are the believers who have uh, lived and died uh, in both 
Old Testament times all the way up through the 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 church age, you know, the saints that were alive during the the first century and it says here that it pretty much talks about everyone and everything in heaven worshiping the Lamb because He is worthy to open the seals, okay? Then chapter 6 talks about the Lamb starting to open the seals, and then that is when the horses start riding. So when the Lamb, or when Jesus, because Jesus Christ is a Lamb, when He starts opening the seals, this is when the tribulation actually begins. So we can see John seeing, and I'm just kind of trying to break down Revelation for you guys. John is seeing the things that have happened and are happening all the way through um, the churches, you know, the, the seven churches that were actually bodies of believers in John's day. And then he is taken up to heaven and he is shown the things that are going to happen, the things which must shortly come to pass. And of course we know, even though it's been 2,000 years, you know, a day to us is thousand years to the father so to them it had not been long you know it was shortly come to pass so we see john in heaven seeing the ages and the you know all throughout history the church history from the time he was writing revelation all the way through to the time when the tribulation begins. The tribulation begins when, right here in Revelation chapter 6, when Jesus starts opening the scrolls. And Revelation chapter 6 and chapter 7 deals with the tribulation. We see that, you know, in Revelation chapter 6, in verse who it says and i saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown and it was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer so there is the first beast of revelation the antichrist the the man of sin the son of perdition we see him here in revelation chapter 6 verse 2 and then in revelation chapter 7 well, also in chapter 6, um, we see other things that are that happen throughout the tribulation that are also shown later in the book of Revelation. And then in chapter 7, in Revelation chapter 7, we actually see that this is the first appearance of the 144,000. And, of course, the 144,000 is a study for another time. If you want to know who the 144,000 are, just go back through the archives and you'll find a, a Revealing Prophecy episode of the Remnant Report that deals specifically with the 144,000 and who they are. But... We continue going through chapter 8, chapter 9, and, you know, we see all the things that happened during the tribulation that, for time's sake, we're not going to go through right now. You know, I've already described a lot of things that um, I hadn't planned on. But we see in Revelation chapter 9, when the fifth angel sounds, because remember, in chapter 8, there are seven angels who each have trumpets, and they start sounding. And in chapter 9, when the fifth angel sounds, an angel comes from heaven unto earth with the key to the bottomless pit. And he opens the bottomless pit, and 
There comes smoke out of the bottomless pit like a great furnace, so much so that the sun and the air were completely darkened by the smoke that comes out of the pit. And then that is when all of these uh, chimera-like creatures, the uh, locusts with tails of scorpions and whatnot, and whatnot come and they torture and they hurt the men and women of the earth who are not sealed with the seal of God. In other words, who are not Christians, part of the church. That would not be possible with if the church had already been raptured. Now, dispensationalist theology tells you that, yes, uh, these people are believers. There are Christians in the tribulation, but they come to Christ and get saved, become part of the, the body through the witnessing of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Hogwash. The church has been there throughout the entire tribulation, and we will be there. Now, that takes us back to where we were at chapter 10. Chapter 10, we saw the seventh angel who was about to sound. The seventh angel with the seventh trumpet, which is what? The last trumpet. Now remember, starting in Revelation chapter 6, we saw the Antichrist come on the scene as the rider on the white horse. And all of these horrible things have taken place during the tribulation. We had all the seals that were opened and things came upon the earth through all of the seals. Then the, we had the seven angels with the seven trumpets, and every time a trumpet was blown, something else came upon the earth, right? Well, when the final angel was about to blow his trumpet, when he was beginning to sound, the Bible says that in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophet. Now, what is the mystery of God that was declared through the prophets? Well, we know from scriptures in both Old and New Testament that each one of the prophets pointed towards Jesus Christ. The, the Bible says that all of the law and the prophets were a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. So in Revelation chapter 10, when that final angel is about to sound, he hasn't sounded yet, but he's about to sound, the mystery of God is finished. Now, when Jesus Christ came the first time, the mystery was not finished, correct? But when he comes back as the conquering king, the mystery as declared by the prophets, pointing to the Messiah coming. What is the reason why the Judeans, the Hebrew people, I refuse to call them Jews because that's not what they are. 
I know that's what the scripture says here, but it's, it's a mistranslation. They were the Judeans. They were of the tribe of Judah. From, and the northern, uh, the southern kingdom of Judah, which was made up of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, with, of course, um, some Levites, because the Levites were scattered amongst um, all the tribes, or both kingdoms. However, they were all looking for this leader to come and be their king. They were all looking for a military leader that would liberate them from the Romans. And when Jesus came the first time, that was not his mission. That's not what he came for. But when he comes back, he's coming back to make sure that all Israel is saved. That's what the rapture is about. The rapture is the resurrection of the dead and the changing of both the dead and the living, the changing of our bodies from corruptible to incorruptible. We will have a glorified body just like our Savior, a body made up of flesh and bone, not flesh and blood. However, when the angel starts to sound, when he's about to sound, that hasn't happened yet. So we're going to go a little farther. To chapter 11. And chapter 11, now remember when this was written, there were no uh, chapter breaks. You know, so chapter 10 just went right on into chapter 11. And it says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city they shall tread under foot forty and two months. Forty and two months. Now, verse 3, I know that it has taken me a while to get here, but trust me, I had to set everything up to be able to reveal the identity of the two witnesses. Now, verse 3 says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth verse 4 these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks which the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut the heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, 
friends, I'm sure that all of you who were not brought up in dispensational pre-trib rapture churches were taught that the church, the, the re remnant body of Christ in the tribulation will be persecuted and even killed by the beast. That the beast is going to make war with the saints. He is going to make war against the church. Now, if we go back to Revelation chapter 2 and 3, in chapters 2 and 3, we see, and it tells us right off the bat at the end of chapter 1, that the seven candlesticks are what? The seven churches. So what does a candlestick represent? Does the candlestick represent a reincarnated prophet or a prophet who did not die in the Old Testament? being sent back to earth during the new test I mean during the tribulation does it say that the two men the two prophets Moses and Elijah who appeared to our Lord on the mount of transfiguration will also come down as the two witnesses during the tribulation or how about this at any time any time are Moses and Elijah or any other prophet for that matter called lampstands? No. The only group or people period that the book of Revelation and Jesus Christ himself calls the lampstands are the churches and out of the seven churches in chapters two and three of revelation out of those seven how many of them actually make it how many of them does jesus not say that he's going to take away their lampstand, that he's going to remove their names from the book of life. How many? Two. How many of them does Jesus have absolutely nothing bad to say about? Two. Okay. So we see that in Revelation chapter 11 that the Bible says here that God is going to give Holy Spirit power the same power that the prophets had I'll give you that the same power that both the Old and New Testament prophets had, but see, the New Testament prophets were the leaders of the church. Now, I'm not finished proving who the two witnesses are. I'm going to give you further proof, but those of you with eyes to see and ears to hear should have already figured out that the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 are the two churches from Revelation 2 and 3. It is a representation. The book of Revelation is a book filled with symbolism. There are things that are inanimate objects and Things like lampstands and trees and mountains 
and stars that represent things other than lampstands, trees, mountains, and stars. So, the, the lampstands themselves, the lampstands themselves, who are also called olive trees. We know that we are all adopted into the Israel of God that is called what? The cultivated olive tree. Now, these two churches, Philadelphia and Smyrna, both, even though they're separate, they represent one body. These two witnesses, even though they're separate, they represent one body, the believers. Now, we are going to go a little further here and prove this a little more. Now, we stop at, chat, at verse number 7, and it says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, now we know that the Bible says that all Israel is going to be saved. And we see the 144,000 who are witnessing and testifying all throughout the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation starts over, and I'm going to show you this in just a minute. But we see that the 144,000 are first mentioned in verse 7. We know that, that dispensationalism say that they are the ones who win everyone to Christ. That they are the one who uh, have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I, um, I don't disagree with this at all. I believe that just like we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, we see each one of these tribes, and I'm not going to get into the, the 144,000 much tonight, other than to say this. You need to watch the episode that I did on the 144,000 because I think I did a pretty good job of showing that the 144,000 absolutely represent the body of Christ. Um, I could be wrong about that. I, I'm not saying that for sure. That's what I believe, and I think that I have, you know, seen very good evidence for it in Scripture, but I do not know it for a fact because, you know, Scripture interpreted Scripture and showed it to me. However, the two witnesses, that is plain to see, and I'm not finished. Now, we see that just like the Bible tells us that the beast is going to make war with the saints, we see that he also makes war against the two witnesses. And it says he shall overcome and kill them. And verse 8 says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. So it shows that they're going to lay in the streets of Jerusalem. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies for three and a half, 
for three days and a half and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in graves. It wouldn't matter if they did. But it says, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall give gifts to one another. So pretty much, you know, it's Christmas time. <laughs> it's one big pagan holiday. They're giving gifts to one another because these two prophets had tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Now, why are they called prophets if they are indeed representations of the body of Christ? Well, what did it say they did after they were given power and they did it clothed in sackcloth. It says that they prophesy for a thousand two hundred and three score days. So not only do they prophesy in verse five, it says that they kill anyone who tries to hurt them with fire that comes from their mouth. And they also have the power to shut up the heavens and stop the rain while it, during the days of their prophecy. And they can turn the waters to blood and smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And they do all this until they are finished with their testimony. Now, these are representations of the church so when i tell you brothers and sisters if you are where you are supposed to be with jesus christ if you are keeping his commandments if you are following in the ways that he set forth for us in the gospels if you are truly, truly living as a born-again follower of Jesus Christ, if you are still alive, when the tribulation comes and the Antichrist is on the scene and we can see that we are in the tribulation, Brothers and sisters, you will have this Holy Spirit power like has never been had for 2,000 years. And even though the Apostolic Church of Acts, the apostles of Jesus Christ most certainly had the Holy Spirit in enough measure to be able to do these same exact things they did not do them why did they not exercise this power because that was not what they were supposed to do they were simply supposed to turn the world upside down and that's what they did without shutting up the heavens and killing people with fire from their mouth they simply used the gospel and they spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the known earth. And the world is still, still affected. What they did, it still is affecting the earth and the people in it to this day. Now, there are a lot of things that I could say about the non-believers and why I believe that we as the church who represent the two witnesses will have this power. I believe that we will need this power and that no one will be able to kill the witnesses or harm the witnesses. And we see this in the text. Only 
the beast is able to harm and kill these witnesses. And the only reason he's able to do it is because God allows it to happen. Now, after the celebrations, everybody's all happy because the Christians are dead, right? Well, we see that after three and a half days, how long was Jesus in the grave for? How long was he uh, down in Sheol in Hades in his tomb? Oh, yeah, that's right. Three days. Yeah, three days and three nights. Pretty much three and a half days. Well, just like our Lord and Savior rose again on the third day, we see the two witnesses. We see after three and a half days, the spirit of life from God, the same Father who resurrected Jesus Christ, set the spirit of life into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon all which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Now you want to talk about the rapture, friends? I just showed you the rapture. It's in Revelation chapter 11, verse 12. There is the rapture of the church. Now, I'll prove it to you. Verse 13, it says, In the same hour, the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain men seven thousand, and the remnant were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe Cometh quickly. What is the third woe? Oh, wait a minute. That's right. We started this in verse 10 when the last angel, the seventh angel who had the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, he was about to sound. And as he was about to sound, it said, What? The mystery of God as told to the prophets is finished. Now, verse 15 of chapter 11 says, And the seventh angel, you know, the same seventh angel from, from chapter 10, says, And the seventh angel sounded, he blew that trumpet, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, I could stop right there, and you should be able to see plainly that I just showed you that the two witnesses are actually the two churches from Revelation 2 and 3 that represent the body of Christ as a whole who have all of this awesome Holy Spirit power and they prophesy for like they prophesy for a thousand two hundred and three score days dressed in sackcloth and then after they have finished prophesying we see that the beast comes and makes war with them kills them they're dead man then the spirit of god proceeds into them and they come back to life that is a perfect picture of the resurrection 
it's also a perfect picture of the rapture because no time later, the seventh angel sounds the final trumpet and they go up to meet Jesus in the air. How do I know they're going to meet Jesus in the air? It didn't say that. Well, let's look. It says, the kingdoms of our Lord are become the kingdoms of his Christ. Well, when does that happen? The second coming, when Jesus comes back. Now, whether you believe in a literal thousand-year reign, a millennium that takes place on this earth, or you believe that as soon as Jesus comes back, uh... It's for eternity, you know, the new heaven and new earth, regardless to your views on the millennium. Nobody can argue the fact that the mystery of God that is finished when the seventh angel sounds is the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdoms of God and of his Christ. The return of Jesus Christ is the mystery of God being revealed. That is the rapture, resurrection, and second coming. Now, it says, and the nations... Hold on a second. Let me, let, let me back up a little bit. Verse 16, and the, four and, and, and the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou should givest reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Can it get any more clear than that? And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark oh, turn my page, of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Now remember I told you that the book of Revelation repeats, right? Okay, well, from verse 4, I mean from chapter 4, to chapter 11 is the great tribulation from start to finish. Then, actually, you might as well say chapter 1 to chapter 11 is the time of Jesus Christ and the first century church. You know, it, go, it starts off in the first century and goes all the way to chapter 11 with the end of the world and the return of Christ. Then, in Revelation chapter 12, it starts over completely. The book of Revelation starts over from the beginning at the first century again. And it says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. This is chapter 12. And a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was called up unto God and to his throne. 
Okay, I'm not going to read the entire chapter 12, but you see that chapter 12 starts over in the first century. And then chapter 13 goes from the first century to the beginning of the tribulation, just like uh, in the beginning of Revelation, how we see the first century going from chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. Chapter 4 is when John is taken up into heaven and shown the vision. And then uh, that's chapter 4 and 5. And then chapter 6 is the beginning of the tribulation. Okay? Well, chapter 13 starts exactly where chapter 6 starts. Just like the rider on the white horse is the uh, Antichrist and the beginning of the tribulation, the same thing happens right here in chapter 13. And it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Okay, um, you can read Revelation chapter 13 for yourself and see what I mean. You can read Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 13 uh, back to back. You can compare them and see that they are both the same events. And you can read Revelation chapter uh, 11 and... It actually starts in chapter 10 when the trumpet is about to be blown. So you can start in um, Revelation chapter 10 in verse 7. You can start in verse 7 and read all the way to the end of Revelation chapter 11 and you will see the end of the tribulation. And just like the tribulation ends in Revelation chapter uh, 11, if you continue from the beginning of the tribulation where it starts over in chapter 13 and you read through because Revelation from Revelation 11 on through to really Revelation chapter 20 um, or Revelation, actually Revelation chapter 19, Revelation, no, Revelation chapter, yeah, Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 20 starts the, uh, the binding of Satan and the, the millennium, but, uh, Revelation chapter 12 through Revelation chapter 19 is the same events only with more detail and a little different symbolism. It's the same events as Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 11. So I would suggest that instead of taking my word for it, although I think I have made, I haven't made anything. All I have done is shown you what the word of God says. I think that the Holy Spirit and the Bible has made a very clear, easy to understand um, way to see that the that the two witnesses in Revelation chapter eleven are the two churches. There is no other way to see it. The only, the only people who are called the lampstands, the only people that the lampstands symbolize is the church. Each church has a lampstand. Each body has a lampstand, and those who are not faithful, those who are not 
um, actually following Christ and keeping his commandments, they lose their lampstand and have their names removed from the book of life. We see these two witnesses are called lampstands, the exact same thing that the churches are called. These two witnesses are representations of churches. They are not actual, just, I mean, they're actual people, but they're not individual people. They are not two individual prophets like Moses and Elijah or Elijah and Enoch. They represent the church. And I sure hope that you guys truly listened. And if for some reason you didn't understand uh, what I showed you, or if you are skeptical, I invite you to prove me wrong. Actually, it's not even proving me wrong. I invite you to prove the scriptures wrong because I didn't give you my opinion tonight. I simply showed you exactly what the Bible calls the two witnesses. And what the Bible calls the churches. And I showed you that after the beast makes war with the two witnesses, the same way he makes war with the saints. We can go a little further. Let's go to where Revelation starts over. And let's look and see um, what the beast does because we see that the beast out of the bottomless pit I gotta I gotta take these off y'all are gonna have to forgive me they're hurting my ears we see that the beast out of the bottomless pit is who makes war against these two witnesses right okay well if the beast out of the bottomless pit is who is making war against these two witnesses. We know that's the Antichrist. Well, if we look through the book of Revelation, we do not see the beast coming out of the bottomless pit anywhere except for Right here in Revelation chapter 9, it does talk about um, the angel that is king of the, um, the chimeric uh, locusts that come out of the bottomless pit, and he is the angel of the bottomless pit, but... It's actually, it actually does not talk about the Antichrist or the same beast um, that we see in Revelation 13. Now, we do see in... We do see in Revelation chapter 7 when it's uh, talking about the 144,000 and the sealing of the 144,000. It does talk about the elders, one of the elders coming up to John and said unto him, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore 
are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them they shall hunger no more neither thirst any more neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto fountains of living waters and god shall wipe away all tears from their eyes now I have heard it said before that Revelation chapter um, 6, actually the entire chapter tells the whole story of the Great Tribulation. And... I truly, um, I have no problem with that because if you read Revelation chapter 6, um, you can actually, in, in chapter 6 and chapter 7, you can see a very condensed telling of the events of the tribulation. And when it gets to, you know, and the reason I say this, and I've said this before, Revelation repeats itself. Well, you've got the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. Well, I truly believe that they, and I've said this many times, and I have studied eschatology from every point of view that man has and they all come up lacking every single one of them is lacking but when i take and just read the scripture and actually let the bible interpret the bible I see things that I have never seen before, and the scriptures come alive to me in ways that they never have. So, I can see Revelation chapter 6 and 7 showing the entire tribulation, especially 6, when the... Um, I'm trying to see when the where the last seal is. Just a second. Remember that pretty much everything in the book of Revelation, just like most of the rest of the Bible in the New Testament comes in sevens because seven is a perfect number. And um, there, that's why there are seven seals, seven trumpets, and bowls. And, you know, each, after each one of these seals are opened in chapter 6, you know, it's actually Jesus that's opening the seals. And when the first seal is opened, that's when we see the Antichrist coming, you know, the on the white horse. And each seal that's opened from one... Um, all the way through four, that's when each of the so-called four horsemen are unleashed. And uh, the fifth seal, it, the fifth seal pretty much... Um, 
just talks about all of the the saints and those who are under the altar, the souls of those who were slain for the word. Uh, that's actually during the tribulation. So we see these people who have been killed and it could also be those who have been killed, you know, in the first century all the way through history. Um, and we see them crying out, you know, how long, O Lord, does, this, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And it, it says that white robes were given unto every one of them and told that they should rest for a little season. And it says something important. It says that their brethren should be killed just as they were. And then it says, And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth. Now, there was another great earthquake that we just read about, and that was in Revelation chapter 11. When the two witnesses are raptured, that is when this great earthquake happens. And it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of Christ. Here it says, and the kings... It's, first it says, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every free men hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? So, you know, we we see that all the way through Revelation chapter 6 to the very end, at the very end of Revelation chapter 6, we see the wrath of the Lamb coming upon the earth, we see the second coming happening. And it's actually after the second coming happens that it says, After these things I saw the four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, so the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And then it talks about, all the different tribes and you know 12,000 from each tribe and then it talks about salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb and it says in Revelation chapter 8 that All the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders, and the four beasts fell upon the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these? which are arrayed in white robes, and which came they? And I said unto him, Sir, 
thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So, we see through Revelation 6 and 7, we pretty much see the entire tribulation and the rapture. And then chapter 8 talks about the seventh seal. And it says, And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And, you know, to me, even though it definitely sounds like the entire tribulation could be summed up in just chapter 6 and 7. Even though there's a very good argument for that, that's not the case. And there are many traditions, uh, eschatological traditions, many people who study prophecy who would say things like that but although the book of revelation repeats itself when you are looking from revelation chapter 6 which starts the tribulation you know you have the antichrist coming with the first seal chapter well first off i've already told you there were no chapter breaks in the original so, what we see is chapter 6, 7, and 8 were never actual chapters like that. What we see is not the way it was, but the way it actually is, is... Just like I told you, or I read earlier how it talked about the number that no man could number. I mean, the the people that well, it might have said number that no man could number, but and it says that the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousand thousands. Well, and it says that they came out of great tribulation, but it also says um, that it talks about them, you know, being under the throne and asking when, Lord, when are you going to uh, revenge our death, and that's me paraphrasing, and it literally says that um, they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren should be killed the same as they were. So, although it looks like the tribulation is completely that the story is compacted and told completely in chapter 6 and 7 it's actually not what it's doing is telling the story talking about those who were beheaded those who were killed during the tribulation just like the bible says that it is going to be and then it describes the different judgments that come upon the earth. They're not the actual wrath of God 
on Christians because we are not appointed unto wrath. The things that come upon the earth like the locust and all of the other horrible things, we see that God seals his own. He seals his children so that they will not be hurt. So we will be protected. So even though the tribulation is the wrath of the beast on the saints of God, we know that God is also sending judgments upon the earth. But the children of God, the sons of God, the believers are protected from these judgments. The locusts, the chimera type creatures, they do not hurt those with the seal of God. They only hurt the non-believers. And we see from Revelation chapter 6 all the way through to Revelation chapter 11, we see the story of the tribulation from beginning to end. We actually see it from Revelation chapter 1 starting in the first century A.D. all the way to the end of the tribulation in Revelation chapter 11. And then sorry, I didn't mean to stop. A.J., uh, you said, what about the boils? No, that does not happen to the believers. Uh, there are some people who believe that when the the different plagues come upon um, the earth and the people of the earth suffer things like the the locusts that sting and the boils that come upon the flesh because there's a plague of boils. I know exactly what you're talking about, but the there is actually seven last plagues and it says in chapter 15 that there are seven last plagues that in them is filled up the wrath of God. So the seven last plagues, the wrath of God, are in the seven last plagues. And it says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And that's actually in heaven. It says, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with the golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore 
upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worship the the image of the beast. So the the boils that come on the people, um, they don't come on the believers because at this time, it, it actually happens in chapter 16, and um, I want to make sure that I am telling you exactly right. The, uh, there are definitely believers in heaven then when the wrath of, of God is actually poured out and it is, uh, Actually, in verse, I mean, in chapter 19, I was trying to find, uh, I was trying to find uh, anything that mentioned the saints after, um, chapter 15 but uh, I truly don't see anything and those are the seven last plagues from chapter 16 all the way through to chapter 19 it talks about a lot of things but these things are actually happening one after the other now I will say this the fact that I believe that um, the wrath of God the, the seven um, the seven last plagues and the final wrath of God, you know, the what's called the wine press of the wrath of God and all of the, the different seven last plagues. I truly believe that the vial of wrath is all poured out one after the other like in the same day or at the same time um and i have very good reasons for believing this we'd be on for another 30 minutes to an hour if i was to explain it but it's actually we can actually see in Revelation chapter 14, we can see the rapture just like we saw it in Revelation chapter 11. Um, like I said, Revelation repeats itself. And from Revelation chapter 13 to Revelation chapter, well, Revelation chapter 12 to Revelation chapter 14 is the repeat of what happens in Revelation chapter 1 to Revelation chapter uh, 6, the end of chapter 6. The beginning of chapter 7, we see the believers in heaven. At the end of chapter 14, we see the believers in heaven. We see the rapture. Um, you know, we see in Revelation chapter 14 where... Uh, uh, well, I was going to say, I was going to talk about um, <laughs> the angel with the uh, sickle that comes and reaps the, the harvest, but that's actually not talking about the the rapture that is actually talking about the uh wrath of god but regardless um (sighs) 
the uh, see this is why I should never get off subject today I was talking about the two witnesses and how they represented the church and I got off on a rant about the uh, different parts of Revelation how it repeats but anyways AJ um, the the boils are actually they, they happen in chapter 16 and it comes from the vile judgments and uh, the first vial is the one that's poured out and the sores the boils as you uh, said come over all the people on earth but just like the uh, the locusts the chimera creatures do not hurt the uh, believers the boils do not come on to the believers this is the wrath of God and um, in Revelation chapter 14 at the end of Revelation chapter 14 we see that the the wrath of God is about to be poured out um, verse 20 says uh, and the wine press was trodden without the city and blood came out of the wine press unto the space of the horses bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs and um, then chapter 15 talks about the seven last plagues and how in them is filled up the wrath of God and um, then it talks about the sea of glass and it talks about all of those who got victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name and how they're standing upon the sea of glass with harp singing the song of Moses and you know it goes on and on about them um, and you know what I, I missed it there is um, it does show the rapture in chapter 14. It says, um, Here is the patience of the saints. This is verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from hence forth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So, at the end of chapter 14, in verse uh, 13 through 16, we see the rapture happening again. Now, we know that there are there's not, you know rapture after rapture after rapture that's going to happen there's only one rapture there's only one second coming so what we are seeing is a repeat of the same thing over and over and um, the biggest point of tonight's program is the two witnesses and the fact that the two witnesses represent the church if we are alive and a part of the remnant bride of Christ if we are true followers who keep the commandments of God and Jesus Christ then we will be a part of these two witnesses the two witnesses represent the two churches why how do I know this to be true? Is it because I learned it in college? Is it because my seminary taught it to me? Or maybe one of my preacher friends told me. Or maybe I learned it growing up sitting in church. No. I didn't see it on a YouTube video. 
I didn't hear it on a podcast. I didn't hear this preacher say it or that preacher say it. I was reading the Word of God, and Mary Callie is my witness. She was with me. When I realized what I was reading, <laughs> words cannot describe the way I felt, the way it just jumped off the page, and the way that I realized truly for the first time in my entire uh, Christian walk that we don't need God to audibly talk to us because we have the Word of God right here. The way we talk to God is through prayer. And of course, the Bible tells us that we don't even know what to pray for. And because we don't know what to ask for, the Holy Spirit literally prays for us. But the way that God talks back to us is through His Word. And guess what? The only way you're going to hear from God is if you're reading His Word. You must be in the Word to hear from God. I don't see, I read things over and over and as God is my witness, nine times out of ten, I get something new and I see something new every time I read the Bible. Every time. And when I was reading Revelation, I had already kind of hinted at this before and kind of even thought about it simply because I saw that there were two churches. This is the only thing that I put it together with. I saw the two churches before when I did the other program and I saw the two witnesses. And I only thing that I saw was that they were both two. That's it. Two witnesses and two churches. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, two witnesses and two churches that the, Jesus didn't have anything bad to say about. That's it. But it was when I was studying it and reading it with Mary that I literally saw everything that I've told you tonight from the fact that the two witnesses are literally called churches, the fact that they are called lampstands people mean that they are called churches because Jesus literally, literally tells us that the lampstands are are the churches. So therefore, when Revelation chapter 11 calls the two witnesses two lampstands, it is calling them two churches. There's no way to get around that. You can have as many fancy degrees as you want. You cannot change the fact that the Word of God calls the two witnesses churches. And when I saw that, then I was reading down further and I literally saw the persecution of the church by the beast when the Antichrist makes war against the, the two um, lampstands, the two witnesses. When he makes war against them, I saw, I said, man, that is exactly what he does to the churches during the tribulation. And then when they die, and then when the Spirit of God comes down from heaven and literally resurrects them the same way that Jesus Christ was resurrected, and then a voice from heaven says, Come up here. We see the rapture and the resurrection. And... You know, just as I showed earlier, Revelation chapter 11 goes a lot farther than that. After the rapture and the resurrection, we literally see that the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of Jesus Christ. I, I don't see how anyone anywhere 
could possibly argue against that legitimately. I mean, I just don't. Um, it says, you know, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of, of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Um, you know, that's pretty much clear to me. But I have pretty much come to the end of all I was going to show you guys tonight. I've actually gone over. <laughs> We've been going for two hours and 20 minutes. To me, it seems like it's been 30 minutes or so. So I apologize for how long I've gone. Um, when I get into the Word of God and uh, I start, I actually forget that I'm even um, on camera sometimes. Um, sometimes it feels the same as if I'm preaching or teaching a class and I just get carried away. So I apologize about that. Trust me, whenever I'm preaching... Um, uh, the congregation uh, goes through the same thing and um, I definitely have people who are not afraid to tell me that uh, I preach too long but in any case I hope that you all uh, enjoyed tonight's teaching and that you were able to see exactly what the Bible was teaching because I didn't teach a thing. All I did was point out things that are right there in the scripture. You know, I didn't I didn't give anybody my opinions except for on a few occasions. And when I gave my opinion, I made sure to tell you, hey, this is not fact. This is my opinion. So guys, I uh thank you so much for taking the time on this Sunday evening of the 4th of July. Yay! I hate this day. This is one of my least favorite holidays. It's not my least favorite because, you know, we, there's always Halloween, Xmas, and Ishtar Day. Those are definitely worse than the 4th of July. But the reason I don't particularly care for Independence Day is because, uh... <sighs> I um, am very proud uh, to be a citizen of the kingdom that I belong to. It's just not America. Sorry, it's not. <laughs> I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And so, therefore, I could care less about uh, American Independence Day. I'm sure there will be a lot of people who uh, like me a lot less for that, but it is what it is. Okay, guys, thank you again for joining. I love each and every one of you, and uh, for the Next Chapter Radio Network and Kingdom Productions, I am the Remnant Warrior, saying until next time, grace and peace, and good night.